Cranford by Elizabeth Craighorn Greskill. Chapter 1 Our Society. In the first place, Cranford is in possession of the Amazons. All the holders of houses above a certain rent are women. If a married couple come to settle in the town, somehow the gentleman disappears. He is fairly, either fairly frightened to death by being the only man in Cranford evening parties, or he's accounted for being with his regiment, his ship, or closely engaged in business all the week in a great neighbouring commercial town of Dumble, distance only 20 miles on railroad. In short, whatever does become of the gentlemen, they are not at Cranford. Well, could they do if they were there? The surgeon well, has his rounds for 30 or 30 miles of sleeps, Cranford, but every man cannot be a surgeon. For keeping the trim gardens full of choice flowers without a weed to speck them, for frightening away little boys look wistfully at the sad flowers, through the railings of for rushing out at the geese, occasionally venture in the gardens, the gates are left open, for studying all qu- questions of literature or politics without troubling themselves, and as for reasons or arguments, retaining clear and correct knowledge of everyone's affairs in the parish, for keeping them neat. Maid servants in adorable order, for kindness somewhat dictatorial to the poor and real tender good offices to each other. Whenever they are in distress, the ladies of Cranford are quite significant. A man is one of them reserved to me once, is so in a way in the house. Although the ladies of Cranford know all each other's proceedings, they're exceedingly indifferent to each other's opinions. Indeed, each has her own individuality, not to say its centricity, pretty strongly developed. Nothing is so easy as verbally retaliation, but somehow goodwill reigns among them to a considerable degree. The Cranford ladies have only an occasional little quarrel, spirited out in few peppery words, angry jerks of the head. Just enough to prevent the even the even tremor of their lives from becoming too flat. Their dress is very independent of fashion, as they observe. What does it signify how we dress here at Cranford, where everybody else everybody knows us? If they go from home, their reason is equally conjunct. What does it signify how we dress here, where nobody knows us? The materials of their dress clothes are in general good and plain. Most of them are nearly as scrumptious. And most of them are nearly as scrupulous as Miss Tyler, or clearly, me- or clearly memory. But they will answer it for it, for it. A little gidget. The last tight and scatty pedagogue in where, to, in where in England was seen in Cranford, and seen without a smile. I can testify to a magnificent family red silk umbrella under which a gentle little spinster left alone from of many brothers and sisters used as patter to church on rainy days. Have you any red silk umbrellas in London? We had a tradition of the first that there had ever been seen in Cranford and little boys mobbed it and called it a stick in petticoats. It might have been a very red silk one I have described, I held by a strong father of a troop, a little one that poor little late old lady, survivor of all, could scarcely carry it. Then there were rules and regulations for visiting and calls. calls. They announced to any young people who might be staying in the town. The old solemnly sublimity with which the old bank's laws were read once a year on the town world mount. Our friends are sent to inquire how they are after your journey tonight, my dear. Fifteen miles in gentleman's carriage. They'll give you some rest tomorrow. The next day, I have no doubt, they will call. So be at liberty about twelve after twelve. or twelve to three, you are, co- are, are calling hours. Then, after they've called, it is the third day. I dare say your mamma has told you, my dear. Never let more than three days elapse for receiving a call and turning it. Also, you are never to stay longer than a quarter of an hour. 
But uh, am I to look at my watch? How am I to find out when a quarter of an hour has passed? You might must keep thinking about the time, my dear, and how I'm not to allow yourself to forget it in conversations. In conversation. Has everyone had this rule in their minds? Whatever they received or paid a call, of course, no reserving subject was ever spoken about. We kept ourselves to short sentences for a little small talk and punctual to our time. I imagine that a few of the gentlefolks of Cran- Cranford were poor and had some difficulty in making both ends meet. But they were like a Spartans and concealed their smart under a smiling face. We none of us spoke of money because the subject save savoured of comments and trade. And though some might be poor, we were all were aristocratic. aristocratic. The Cranfinians had a cunning and spirit de corps, which made him overlook any deficiencies in success. When some among them tried to conceal their poverty, when Miss Foster, for instance, gave a party for baby in a, in a baby house of a dwelling, the little maiden disturbed the ladies on the sofa by a quest that she might get a tea tree, 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 at, tea tree out from beneath. Everyone took this novel proceeding, the most natural thing in the world, took on by the house of forms and ceremonies, as if it, we all believed our hostess had a regular servant's hall, second table, the housekeeper and steward, instead of one little charity school maiden, whose short ruddy arms could never have been strong enough to carry the tray upstairs. She had not been assisted in private by mistress, and now sat in state, pretending not to know what cakes were sent up. Though she knew, we knew, and she knew that we knew, we knew that she knew that, that we knew. She had been busy all the morning making tea bread and sponge cakes. There was one, there were one or two coincidences arising from this general but an unknowledged poverty, this very much acknowledged gentility, which was not amiss, which might be introduced into other circle, many circles of society in a great for the great improvement. For instance, the inhabitants of Cranford kept early hours and clattered home in their, pa- in their patterns under the guidance of lantern bearer about nine o'clock at night. The whole town was to bed and asleep by half past ten. Moreover, it was considered vulgar, tremendous word in Cranford, to give anything expensive, way available or drinkable, the evening entertainments. Wafer, bread and butter, and sponge biscuits were all the honourable Miss Jason gave. She was sister-in-law to the late Earl of Grenamine, although she did practise such an elegant economy. An economy, how natural one falls back into the physiology of Cranford. Be there, the economy was always elegant, and money spending always vulgar, obtrus- and uh, tre- not and centrist as sort of sour gratism and made him very peaceful and satisfied. I shall, I shall never forget the dismay he felt when a certain Captain Brown came to live at Cranford and everybody spoke about his being poor. Not a whisper to an intimate friend, the doors or windows being previously closed, but a public street, a loud mended voice, allegedly poverty, the reason for not taking a particular house. The ladies of Cranford were already, ra- were already rather moaning of evasion their charities, a man and a gentleman. He was a half pay captain, had obtained some situation on the neighbouring railroad, which had been firmly petitioned against a little town, and if in addition to his masculine agenda, his connection with a obnoxious railroad, he was so brazen to be talk of being poor. Why then, indeed, he must be sent to commentary. Death was as true as common's poverty, yet people never spoke about it that loud out in the streets, is a word not to be mentioned to ears polite. He had tactfully agreed to gnaw that any with whom he associated on terms of by visiting equally would never be prevented never be prevented by poverty from doing anything that they wished. If he, if he walked or from a party, it was because the night was so fine, or the air was so refreshing, not because the sedan chairs were expensive. We wore pants instead so of silks because we preferred a washing material and so on till we blinded ourselves to the vulgar fact that we 
Well, all of us, people of very moderate means. Of course, the enemy did not speak what to make of a man who could speak of poverty as if it was not a disgrace. Yet somehow Captain Brown made himself respected in Cranford and was called upon in spite of all resolutions. He resolved solutions to the contrary. I was surprised to hear his opinions quoted as authority as a, at a visit which was paid to Cranford, but a year after he settled in town. My other friends had been among the British opponents who opposed a visit captain and his daughters, and he ate twelve months before. Now he's, he, now he's even admitted the taboo hours before twelve. True, it was to discover the cause of the smoking chimney for the fires lit, lighted, but still Captain Brown walked upstairs, nothing daunted. Spoke in a voice too large for the room, and joked quite in the way of a tame man about the house. He had been blind to all the small slights and missions of trivial commissaries which he had been received. He had been too friendly for the Cranford ladies, had been cool. He had answered small sarcastic compliments in good faith, with his own his manly frankness, had overpowered all the shrinking which made, met him as a man who was not ashamed to be poor, and at last his excellent Mexican common sense, his facility in devising expedients to overcome domestic demurmers, had gained him an extraordinary place in his authority among the Cranford ladies. He himself went on his course as unaware of his popularity. He had been of the reverse, and sure he started one day. When we found his advice to so highly esteemed as to make some counsel which he had given a jest to be taken in sober, serious earnest. It was on this subject an old lady had an ordinary cow which he looked upon as a daughter. She could not pay the short quarter of an hour call without being told of the wonderful milk or wonderful intelligence of this animal. The whole town knew the Connie regarded Miss Betsy Barker's ordinary. Therefore, Great was sympathy and great. When in an ungodly moment the poor cow tumbled in the line pit, she moaned so loudly he soon heard and rescued. Meanwhile, the poor beast had lost most of her hair, came out looking naked, cold, and miserable, and bare skin. Everyone pitied the animal, though a few could not restrain their smiles. Her droll appearance, Miss Betty Barker, Betsy Barker, actually cried with sorrow and dismay, and said she thought. Of trying to buy a bath of oil. His remedy perhaps was recommended by someone someone of the number whose advice he asked. The proposal, if ever it was made, was not on the head by Captain Brown's decided. Get her a flannel waistcoat, a flannel drawers, madam, if you wish to keep her alive. But my advice is to kill the poor creature at once. Miss Betsy Barker's dried her eyes and faked the Captain Harley. She went to work by and by, all the town turned out to see. Audrey, meekly going to a parcha clad in dark grey flannel. I have to watch her myself many a time. Do you ever see a cow's dress in grey flannel in London? Captain Brown had taken to a small house on the outskirts of the town. He lived with his two daughters. He must have been upwards of sixty at the time of the first of the first visit I paid at Cranford. Of the left as a, as left. It as a residence, but he had a rarely well trained, uh, elastic figure, a star of military throwback of his head, springing step, which made him appear much younger than he was. He always sort of looked almost as old as myself, to the fact he's real a more than a proper age. Miss Brown must have been forty, she had a sickly pained careborn expression on the face. Look this gaily of youth, her long faded out of sight. Even when young she must have been plain and hard featured. Miss Jessie Brown, been ten years older, younger than her sister, and twenty years shade prettier. Her face was round and dimpled. Miss Jenkins once said in passion against Miss Captain Brown, the cause of which I tell you presently, and she thought it was time for Miss Jessie to leave off her dimples, not always to be trying to look like a child. True, there was something childlike in her face. There will, there will, will be, I think, still till she dies. Oh, she could live to be hundred. 
Her eyes are large, blue, wandering eyes, looking straight at you. Her nose is uninformed with snow and stub. And her eye lips are red and dewy. She wore her hair too in little rows of curls, which hide in this appearance. I do not know whether she is pretty or not, but I liked her face. I did not and did every one. I do not think she could help her dimples. She had every, something of her father's great jauntness of gaunt to the manor. An evening observer might detect a slight difference in the attire of the two sisters. Uh, Miss Jessie being about two pounds per annum more expensive. Miss Brown's two pounds was a large sum in, sum in Captain Brown's annual disbursements. Such is the depression made upon me by Brown family. I first saw them all together in the Cranford Church. The church, Captain and I met before on occasion a smoky chimney, which he had cured by some simple alteration. The flu in church, he held his double eyeglass to his eyes during the morning hymn, and then lifted up his head erect and sang out loud and joyfully, made his responses louder as clerk. An old man with great piping, feeble voice, who I think felt aggrieved at the Captain Serona's brace, and quivered higher and higher in consequence. On her coming out of church, the brisk captain paid most gallant attention to his two daughters. He nodded and smiled to his acquaintances. But he shook hands with some nun, so he helped Miss Brown fill her umbrella and lead her of her prayer book, and wanted pa- waited patiently to see with trembling nervous hands, taken up her gown to walk through the wet roads. I wonder what Cranford ladies did with, with Captain Brown at their parties. He'd often rejoice in former days, of no gentleman to be attended to, to find a conversation for, a card gaining parties. We had congr- congratulated ourselves upon the smugness of our evenings, our love of fragility, to taste of mankind, we must have persuaded herself that to be man was to be vulgar. So when I found my friend and hostess, Miss Jenkins, was going to have a party my honour, that Captain and Miss Browns were invited. And Miss Browns were invited, I wondered which, how wondered much what would be on course of the evening, car cables, with green to blazer tops, were set out by daylight, just as usual. It was the third week of November, so the evening closed in about in about four. Candles and clean cars, packs of cars were arranged at each table. Fire was made up, a neat maiden servant received her in last last directions, and there we stood dressing our best each with a candlelight in our hands, ready to start our candles as soon as the first knock came. Parties of Cranford were seldom solemn facilities facilities. Megan and ladies feel gravely elated as they sat together in the best dresses. As soon as the three had arrived, sat down the preference of doing, being the unlucky fourth. The next four comers were put down immediately to another table, a presently tea tables, trays which had been sent out in the storeroom to pass in the morning, were each placed in the middle of the card table. In front of a delicate eggshell, the old-fashioned silver glittered with polishing, but his stateables was of the slightest description. The trays were yet on the tables. Captain and Miss Browns came in. I could see that somehow or another the captain was a favour, all the ladies present. Brother Browns, with smooth, sharp voices lowered, his approach Miss Brown looked ill and depressed and almost the gloom. Miss Jessie smiled as usual and seemed and nearly as popular as a father. He immediately and quietly assumed the man's place in the room, tended every one's wants, lessened the party made servants labour by one waiting on empty cups and bed butter la- butterless ladies, yet did it all so easy and dignified in a manner, so much as if it were a court but of course was strong to attend to the weak, the true man for out, played for three penny points with, with as grave an interest they were been pounds, and yet, with all his attention to strangers, he had an eye on his suffering daughter, the suffering as I was sure she was, for it too many, though, to many eyes she might only appear to be irritable. Miss Jessie could not play cards. She talked to titters out, who before her coming, she'd rather inclined to be cross. She sang, too, in an old crank on a to an old cranked, cracked piano which I think had a spinet, uh, been a spinet in his youth. Miss Jessie sang 
jock of head's aim. A little out of tune, which we were we all the nerves musical, like Miss Jenkins beat out time out of time by the way of appearing to be so. It's very good of Miss Jenkins to do this, for I've seen that a little before. You've been a little a good deal annoyed by Miss Jessie Brown's other admission protest of Shetland Wall. She had an uncle, a uh, mother's brother, who's a shopkeeper in Edinburgh, Miss Jenkins tried to drown in his confession by a terrible cough. When the old Miss Brims Jimson was sitting at the card table nearest Miss Jessie, would, and what would she say or think if she found out that she was the same room as shopkeeper's niece? But Miss Jessie Brown, who had no tact as well, we all agreed, the next morning would repeat the information. Sure Miss Paul could easily get her the identical Shetland wool required for her my uncle, who was the best of some of Shetland goods of any in Edinburgh. It was take it was to take the taste out of the, our mouths and sound of, out of our ears. And Miss Jenkins proposed music, so I am saying again, very good of her to beat time to the song. The trays reappeared with biscuits and wine. Punch at quarter to nine. There was a conversation, comparing the cards and talking over tricks. But by and by, Captain Brown sported a bit of literature. Have you seen any numbers of the Pickwick? Pad- Pickwick? Papers said he. They had been publishing parts, Captain Capital thing. Now Miss Jenkins, the daughter of deceased rector of Cranford, and a strength of a number of manuscript sermons, a pretty good library of divinity, because it's self literary, and looked upon any conversation about books to challenge to her. So she answered and said, "Yes, she had seen them. Indeed, she might say she had read them." What do you think of them? exclaimed Captain Brown. Are they famously good? So urged uh, Miss Jenkins could not speak. I must might say I don't think they are by any means equal to Doctor Johnson. Shall I perhaps the author is young, let him preserve. Who knows what he may become if he will take the great doctor for his model? Is there only too much for Captain Brown to take placity? Placity, and I saw the words of Tippy's tongue for Miss Jenkins had finished her sentence. It's quite a different sort of thing, my dear madam, he began. I'm quite aware of that, returned her. And I make allowance, Captain Brown. Just allow me to read out you have seen out his month's number, he pleaded he. I had only this morning. I don't think the company can have read it yet. As you please, said her, she, taking herself in for an air of resignation. He read an account of the soiree which Sam Weller gave at Bath. Some of us laughed heartily. I did not kick there, because I was staying in the house. Miss Jenkins sat in patient gravity. When then it was ended, she turned to me, said with mild dignity, Fetch me Russell's, my dear, out of the book room. When I brought it to her, she turned to get it round. Now allow me to read you a scene, and present company can judge between your favourite Mr. Boz and Dr. Johnston. <coughs> She read out one of the conversations between Rosales and Imerek. I pitched a majestic voice, and when she ended, she said, I imagine I can justify my preference to Dr. Johnson by the fiction. Captain screwed up his, lip, his lips up, drummed on the table, but he did not speak. She thought she would uh, she thought she would give him a finishing blow or two. I said it vulgar and below the dignity of literature, published in numbers. How was Rambler published, madam? said Captain Brown in a low voice, which I think Miss, Miss Jenkins could not hear. Dr. Johnson's told was a model for young beginners. A father recommended it to me, began to write letters. I formed my own style upon it. I recommend it to your favourite. Your favourite should be very sorry for him, but strange his style for any such pompous writing, said Captain Brown. Miss Jenkins felt as this a personal front, the way in which Captain not dreamed as re- Tory writing, she and her friends considered be a forte. Many a copy of many a letter been written and corrected on the slate before she seized the half hour just previous to post them. Time to assure her friends of this or that, and Johnson Johnson was, as she said, a model of these compositions. She drew herself up with dignity and only replied to Captain Brown's last remark by saying the marked emphasis on a very on every syllable, I refer Dr. Johnson to Dr. Mr. Bowers. It is said, I don't vouch for the fact that Felton Brown was heard to say, sotto voice, Dr. 
Johnson, if he did, he was penitent afterwards, as he showed by going to Stanley in Miss Jenkins' armchair, endeavouring to beguile her conversation with some more pleasing subject, on some more pleasing subject. <coughs> but she was inexorable. The next day she made a remark and mentioned about Mrs. Jessie's dimples.